Good morning, Coastal Community. Let's stand to our feet and let's worship God this morning. Come on.
Good morning, church. How are you guys doing this morning? You had the joy of the Lord this morning? All right. First service, they were almost awake. So it sounds like you guys are a little bit more awake. All right. So just a couple quick announcements. But first, my name is Dan. I serve here as the Connections Pastor. So if you don't know me, come come and say hi. Um, speaking of connections, we would love to get connected with you. Uh, there are cards in the seat pocket in front of you. It can show how you can get connected to our ministries. You can serve. You can see what's going on. It will also help you connect with our church center app. Um, If you need more information or just need help, we have an information center out in the lobby. We would love to connect with you. Now, another thing, uh, we have a bonfire coming up on October 21st at 645. If you could register, it is free. There's going to be hot dogs and s'mores and uh, water, and we're going to have a huge bonfire. Um, That's usually how I lost my hair is bonfires, but um, we're going to have a great time. Um, so I hope to see you there. Uh, it'll be a blast, uh, and it'll be 6.45 to 8.30. And uh, we have one other announcement, but our overseer, Mike Tiller, is going to come and share that with you. Good morning. You know, don't tell the 8 o'clock service, but you guys are much better looking than them. That's all I got to say. That's, well, no, I, I can't say. That's why I can say that. <laughs> Hey, next Sunday, uh, once a year, we do something special for our pastors, and next Sunday is going to be that day. So what we ask that if you would come prepared, if you want to make out a card, we'll actually have some cards here if you forget it uh, for you to fill out. Uh, If you want to give them a gift of any kind, monetary or gift cards, if you do a monetary gift, please make it out to the individual pastors. I just got a form by the accountant. If we don't do that, we got to tax it as wages. And if you know, um, Uncle Sam likes his share of everything. So that's that's that story, and I'm sticking with it. Um, and my last name is T I L L E R. So, uh, no, <laughs> I'm just you know always need cash. You know how that is. Hey, it's good to have you with us this morning. And uh, uh, first service, just to give you an idea, of those empty spaces between you, a hundred people in that first service this morning. It's all the early birds. So. God bless you. All right, we're gonna we're gonna jump into prayer. Uh, And we're going to jump back into worship. But would you just invite God to be a part of what he's doing this morning here at Coastal? Father God, we thank you. We thank you that we get to come here and worship you. God, we thank you that you are holy. God, we thank you that you are perfect. God, we thank you that you're amazing. God, we thank you that we get to partner with you and what you're doing in Berlin. God, we just want to invite you in this morning and just teaching of your word and in the worship, Lord God, would you start to speak to us right now? Father, we just long to be in your presence. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. I worship you, 
stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you're working Our God is so good. What you just heard was the Hebrew of that song. And the reason that Hebrew touches me so much is because in that chorus, the Hebrew doesn't say promise keeper. It says keeper of the covenant. It's just so beautiful, and we miss it. You are here because God kept his covenant. That's why you're here, because God loves you and sent his son to die for you. 
so you could be here to, to be in a grafted branch into that olive tree so that you could be in God's kingdom. That's the beauty. God was faithful. He's always faithful. He's the way maker. He made the way when there was no way for us because of our sin. He's the keeper of the covenant, the light in the darkness. That's who our God is. That's why we sing. That's why we praise. That's why we gather. Because he's so, so good. God, I just thank you. God, we give you praise. God, I thank you for being such a great God to keep your covenant with us even when we didn't keep our end. God, you are so good. So good. God, I pray that our hearts in unison cry out to you in this worship this morning, not just in our worship through song, but as we listen to the word and as we grow together as a community, God, that you would be on the forefront of our minds always because of how good you are. And God, we pray that we experience you and that we continue to know you and grow closer to you each and every day. Because God, you're so good. And we truly desire to see your will done here on earth as it is in heaven. We give you all the praise. Let's continue to worship this morning.
car walls down Spirit break out Heaven come down Lord, we thank you for where you are, Lord. There is healing, there is love, there is mercy, there is grace, there is beauty. God, we just want to sit in your presence today. Lord, speak to us. Lord, inhabit this praise this morning. Lord, we need your presence. It is not an option. God, we need your presence. In order to get through this thing that we call life, Lord, we need your presence. And God, I pray that today you would open our hearts to what you have for us, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word as well. God, that we would apply this to our lives, that we would live out your purpose for us. Lord, that you would make the way clear. God, remove any distractions, anything that might be on our minds, any stressors, Lord. Lord, help us to focus on you and only you this morning because that's why we're here. We didn't come for anything else. We didn't come to see people, Lord. We came to see you. And Lord, you have already shown up and God, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. And I pray that you would just continue to move in this place, continue to speak to our hearts, continue to open our minds. Lord, help us to dive deep into your word, deeper than we have ever before. Give us a desire, Lord, from deep within us, deep within our hearts, to know you, to live like you, to love like you, to walk like you, inside and outside of these walls. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your sweet presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, uh, it is my honor to announce that we have a special guest with us. Um, about every month, we have a missionary that comes and shares what God's been doing in their lives. Uh, but this morning, we have a missionary called Wendy Rawls. And she, um, wow, she just shook the house down last service. Um, I believe that God has used her and anointed her in an area that our country is very much in need of. Her and her family minister to families that go through abortion, and she ministers them, and she shares the love of Christ and tries to bring healing and brokenness and lostness. Um, so would you welcome her this morning as she comes on up here? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Dan. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. All the glory to the Lord. Amen. Amen. I mean, no pressure, Pastor Dan. Man, now they're expecting me to be good. <laughs> good morning, Coastal Church. Coastal Community Church. Sorry, Coastal Community. Sorry, my bad. I'm still learning. Oh, man, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Whew. 
This thing, you got this thing on, right? I said, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Oh, okay. There you are. Hey, hey. All right. Now, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, she's bold. I am. And I need your help this morning. You see, I don't like to preach by myself. So I'm going to need you to be like, yes, and amen, and say it louder for the people in the back. Okay. I need you to be with me this morning. Are you with me this morning? Yeah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Now we can go. I've had coffee. We're good. Okay. I just want you to know, first and foremost, that the leadership of this church is anointed and powerful, and I am so honored and privileged to be invited here today. You guys have amazing pastors and an amazing team. Amen. And it is so incredible to be a part of your services this morning and to meet the church fam. I love it. I already feel like I belong here. So it's great. Maybe we'll just stay. Um, so we, I say we because I just love to give accolades and I love to brag a little bit on my family because I cannot do this without them. So my oldest son got me a sticker. It says, I run on caffeine, Jesus, and chaos. This is why. Y'all notice something, something, don't you? I'm the only, I'm the only girl. Y'all pray, Y'all pray for, for me. me. Pray for, pray me. for like, me. Like, like this, this is not what I, what I ordered. ordered. But this, but is, this what is what I got. I got. <laughs> so, I'm just kidding. I love, I love these boys to boys death. death. And, um, and um, I, would I would not have it any other, way. Any other way. My husband, Tyler, Tyler and I. Hey, boo. Hey, boo. We've been married for 12 years. And we, you know, live every day. We just live for the Lord. We don't ever talk about divorce. I bring up murder every so often. But never, never divorced. Never divorced. And so Jackson, and so Jackson is our oldest son. son. He's, he's almost 10. 10. He's, he's in fourth grade. grade. He knows it all. And, uh, and uh, Camden, Camden is almost eight. Is almost eight. He's, in, he's second in second grade. And he has, and an, he has incredible an incredible miracle story. I have to come back, to come back another time, another time and tell you about story. But he was he born, was born um, with um, um, diagnosed with spina bifida and hydrocephalus. They did an in utero surgery at the Children's Hospital Philadelphia on us. Well, I was still pregnant. And the Lord has just done miracle after miracle after miracle on our boy's life. And we are a walking, a walking uh, testimony, uh, testimony of faith in God's goodness. goodness. You know, we say, we say, yes, to God, all the glory. It's been amazing, amazing. Um, um, and then our youngest, then our youngest son, son is Bryson. Bryson. He's, he's four, four, and he's the and baby. He's the baby. Yeah. If yeah. you don't know what that means, it's because you're the baby of your family. Okay? okay. And you are and you raw, raw ten, ten, but two but teeth. Two teeth. Okay. Okay. Or maybe four. Or maybe because four. It's, it's just, it's just bad. bad. That baby can that be like, baby Mommy, I want the moon. I'm like, does anybody have a rocket? Does anybody have a rocket? It's great, though. And we are just so blessed to have these three young men of God that we're trying to raise. And it's been an adventure. We are affectionately deemed the rowdy rawls because you hear us before you see us. And uh, you'll you'll know know when we're coming. coming. You'll know when we're we're around. around. But But I love love doing doing this life life with them. them. About a year ago, ago, I transitioned transitioned into this role role of missionary. missionary. And I get to actually actually be a missionary to the United United States States of America, America, which I just love. (laughs) And um, And, um, specifically specifically to Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia. Virginia. So it is my honor to be with you in Maryland this morning. And we did first service. I did not know 6 o'clock came twice in one day. I'm not going to lie to you. So that was a little early, but you guys are here and you are ready to rock and roll, right? Amen. I love it. I love it. Um, Our founder of Save One, which is a post-abortion recovery ministry that helps men, women, and families recover from the choice of abortion. Our founders are Jack and Sheila Harper. They're out of Nashville, Tennessee. And she has an intro video that I'd like to share with you today. Just gives a little deep dive into the ministry, helps you understand a little more of what we do here at Save One. At Save One, we help men, women, and families recover after abortion. And sometimes people ask, why are you helping those people? That not it too late for them? Why aren't you trying to prevent abortion? Why are you helping those people who have already made that choice? And it's our philosophy at Save One. They are exactly who we need to be reaching in the church because their stories are so powerful. This is the greatest prevention of abortion we have. The people who have the personal experience finding forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and then they're able to go into our communities and tell that truth. They then become these walking billboards of grace and mercy for Jesus' forgiveness. It's exactly what happened to me. I spent seven years after my own abortion hating myself. I had an attempted suicide. I became reliant upon drugs and alcohol just to get through the day. But then I found my way to a Bible study, much like the one Save One offers, 
and that is what changed my life. I was introduced to a Jesus that forgives the sin of abortion, and I haven't been able to be quiet about it since then. What we're finding at Save One are these men and women who come through the Save One program, they then turn around and become the loudest voices that we have. It, they're an unstoppable force almost. When Jesus lets you let you out of this self-imposed prison, it's like you, you're compelled to tell people what he has done. The Bible tells us that in Revelation 12, 11, we overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. That's how we know abortion recovery is the key to ending abortion in our country and around our world. Because when we start telling what God has done for us, we become more powerful than the enemy. And so that's absolutely incredible to see. Plus, Proverbs 18, 21 says, the power of life and death are in our tongue. So when we start taking up this language of life, we become these powerhouses speaking God's word and changing the atmosphere. It is absolutely incredible. We, we do this work through three Bible studies that we've written. The women's Bible study, we started having success. Men started asking to go through. My husband and I, Jack, wrote the men's study, and then we started having grandparents and siblings want to come through, and we wrote The Ripple Effect. And so these three studies mirror each other. So a pregnancy center can offer one abortion recovery Bible study and invite anyone who is abortion wounded. The church is the first place we should turn to for help, not the last. It's time that the church rise up using the Save One program and do something about the abortion issue. every three women of childbirthing age have had an abortion. What this tells us at Save One is that one in every three men have lost out on the opportunity of fatherhood. And there is definitely a ripple effect. There is someone else who has been hurt or, or connected to this abortion choice in some way, shape, or form. And my friends, the truth of that statistic today is that truth is, is that it's not just in your community. It's also true right here inside of the walls of the church. And there are broken and hurting people all around us. And it is our job, it is our opportunity, it is our assignment to show them a God who is love, to show them a God who is full of grace and mercy and who can forgive, restore, and redeem. And hallelujah. Anybody in the house this morning hearing me today? Come on, church. It's our job and it's our opportunity to start bringing those people in and showing them the love of Jesus. In particular, I get to work with those who have chosen that road of abortion, but there are so many other things, and you can fill in the blank for whatever that might mean to you or might mean to your family, might mean to your neighbor, to your coworker, to your enemy. <laughs> but today, I don't want to talk about the politics, the left, right, uh, his choice, her choice, left, right, that, blah, mm -mm. That's not what I want to talk about today, because I feel like that there's a deeper issue inside of our big C church. I feel like until we can address the, the ideology of spiritual breakthrough, that we as a big C church are never going to be able to see the transformation that needs to happen in some of those who are sitting right here amongst us. For some of us, we've been sitting alone and afraid to talk about a sin that has been eating us up inside because we're too full of shame and guilt and sorrow and despair. But today, I want to address some of those things, and I want you to know that there there's breakthrough here for you today. Amen? Amen? Amen. So if you will, in your Bibles or on your devices, turn with me to Judges 6. That's right. We're headed to the Old Testament. And in Judges 6, we find the origin story of our friend Gideon. Many of you know him as the fleece guy, right? Like he is the one who's like, Lord, are you sure? And Lord's like, yes. He's like, Lord, are you double sure? And Lord's like, Yes, yes. And he's like, Lord, one more. Yes, I'm sure. That's Gideon, okay? So you may know him or not. But we're going to find Gideon at, right at the origin of the Israelite nation, his making their homes, okay? And what we read in the first six verses is, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to Midian seven years and they oppressed Israel. Because of Midian, the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites, the Amalekites, the mosquito bites, and the Ketamites, and all the ites came and attacked them. They encamped against them and destroyed the produce of the land. Even as far as Gaza, they left 
nothing, no thing for Israel to eat, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey. For the Midianites came with their cattle and their tents like a great swarm of locusts. They and their camels were without number, and they entered the land to waste it. So Israel became poverty-stricken because of Midian, and the Israelites cried out to the Lord. So these first couple verses, I just want to unpack those just for a minute. I want to show you a couple key things. Because the Israelites, how I envision it, is that they have these beautiful gardens, right? They're full of ripe produce. They have this big, huge barn in the middle. It's got all the livestock and the cattle are are moving in the background, right? Like, y'all hear it? You feel it? Yeah? No poop. Don't do the poop smell. Don't imagine that, okay? No, everything but that. No manure. And then over on this side are like fields of grain. They're just like swaying in the wind, right? It's beautiful man. And they've poured their whole life into this. This is who they are. They're farmers. They're people of the land. Everything they do is for their family. Anybody identify with this, right? Their blood, their sweat, their tears, everything goes into this. And they're constantly pouring in, constantly pouring in. And what we read in Judges is that at the very last moment, right before it's time to collect on that harvest, right before it's time to get all the goods, what happens? The enemy comes in. He's like, Nope. And I'm like, hold hold on a second. I have been there. Have you been there? I have been there. Because I, I, I prepared Thanksgiving dinner. And I spent two weeks making 14 pies, 28 casseroles, and a 42-pound turkey. And it was gone in like eight seconds, you know? Like, that's what it feels like. Has anybody been there? No? No Thanksgiving dinner preppers in the room? It's getting close. Y'all better get your pumpkin now. I'm just telling you. It's getting close. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy on my soul. These stinking Midianites done come in and taken everything. I can identify with that. But on a more serious note, y'all are not laughing with me today. Okay, the uh, the first service laughed at that. So y'all just going to have to give me a second to regroup. I thought that was funny. Y'all didn't think that was funny. It's fine. They're like, we take Thanksgiving very seriously here in Maryland. Okay, I don't know what y'all do in Virginia. (laughs) You're allowed to laugh in church. We should have prefaced with that, Pastor Dan. We forgot that part. You're allowed to laugh in church. I think think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. But the Midianites would come with all their friends, right? And they would take everything. The, The scripture says there was no thing left. They took all the cattle, all the livestock. There's no way to work the land. I mean, they even took the grapes off the vine. So I do believe that when they came in, that the Israelites, they were shook, right? I mean, it was like when they ran to hide, when it says they made hiding places for themselves, I understand that. I get that. I'm like, yeah, I could see why. These, the enemy was ruthless, And then it also says in in verse one, did you catch for how long that was? The oppression was for seven years. Now, I'm okay with the first year, right? Because like they didn't know better. It was like, surprise, we're here to take all your stuff. Year two, they were like, oh, again? Ah, okay. Year three, like, come at me, bro. Like, I'm ready to fight. Are you kidding me? Seven years? I mean, bam, 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 bam. Bam, bam, bam. Year after year after year after year after year after year. Where I've poured my life into something. And the enemy's just going to come and take it away? And I'm going to keep letting him do that? I'm going to keep letting him time after time after time after time after time after time after time? Seven, whoo, seven years years. And then in verse six, they're like, oh yeah, Lord, now that we are so impoverished, we have nothing. We can't even trade with other countries or nations because we literally have nothing to give, nothing to trade. We're starving. We're so hungry. We're so angry. We're hangry. And ain't no Snickers going to solve this problem, Lord. So Lord, help. Right? Like, that's where we find the Israelites. And I love that the Lord's answer to them is just a good old farmer boy. He's just an average dude. And his name is Gideon. And we find Gideon in verse 11 that he was threshing wheat in the wine vat in order to hide it from the Midianites. Now, 
I know that most of you are probably really familiar with threshing wheat. So all of this next part is just for me. It's just a refresher. Don't worry, okay? (laughs) But for those of you who have never threshed wheat before in your life, like myself, (laughs) I had to Google this. I had my Google help. Uh, So here's the deal. When you thresh wheat, I actually have a picture. You need a large, flat surface, and it needs to be like really hard, and you take it and you use your livestock, and it's a community style event, and you come and and they break apart the, the, the grains of the wheat, and then you need access to the wind because you'll throw this up, and I have a picture of them throwing it in the air, and the shaft will blow away, and the grain will fall to the ground, and that's how you collect it. So you need a large surface, flat and hard, community style event with access to the wind. You need those four things, okay? The scripture says that we find Gideon in a wine vat, which looks like this. Small, walls on on sides, curved bottom, no access to the wind. No, okay, we got to give him a little bit of accolades, right? Everybody else was like, run for your life. And Gideon was like, yeah, but I mean, I, do, I got some wheat. So maybe if I stay, I can maybe try to, to make something out of this little bit that I have right here. So we got to give him like a little bit of accolades. The problem that I find is that he was using the wrong tools in the wrong place at the wrong time on his own strength. Come on, church, are you hearing me this morning? Are you with me this morning? I know it's hard to talk when I'm doing heart surgery on you, but I need you to be with me, I need to hear you. Are you with me, okay? Because he was using what? The wrong tools. He was using the wrong place, and he was using the wrong time on his own strength. And how many times have I tried to do it on my own? And I, I'm, I'm trying on my own timing, on my own envisioning of what I think it should be, of what I think I should do, of how I think it should go. But I'm finding myself in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong tools on my own strength, failing. Failing. And guess what? We're hiding. We're hiding in a pit. Because we think the enemy can't see us in here. We think we're doing something. Well, it's comfortable in here. I mean, it's a little small. Nobody else can really fit in. I can't really let anybody else in this space, but it's okay. Because I'm fine. It's fine. Everything is fine. And I've got it going on right here. Just use, I mean, that's not the right tool, but, I, but it's working. It's okay. I mean, I'm not going to have much. I'm not going to be able to produce a whole lot, but I can produce just enough. And then I just, You think you're hiding from the enemy? That's right where he wants you. And I want you to know today, this is supposed to be encouraging to you in verse 12. The Lord sees you. He knows you. He hears your heart's desires. He knows every prayer you've prayed. He's seen every tear you've cried. But he's going to look at you just like he looked at Gideon. And he's going to say, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I need you to hear me say that today because you and I, we're just like Gideon. We're just your average, go-lucky, happy people, right? Like we're just doing the work. We're out there doing it. But the problem is, is that sometimes we try to do it on our own methods and our own strength and we're hiding away. And the Lord can't use us as much as he'd like to because we're on our own strength. And the Lord is like, no, 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 no. Like if you'll come with me, I see you as a mighty warrior. I have plans for you, child. I need you to go do some things for me. The Lord is with you. And I can just envision the Lord reaching down his hand while he's saying that. Can you? He's like, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And pulling him up out of that pit, out of that pit. Whatever your weakness, habit, addiction, attitude, choice, it doesn't matter. It is not worth hiding away. It is not worth using your own strength. We must understand that we can rely on the Lord and he will renew us and restore us and redeem us and make us victorious as mighty warriors. 
I think that it is our job to be the truth tellers in our society and in our culture. I think one of the reasons that it's easy to hide in a pit is because I don't have to talk about abortion, Wendy, when I'm down in that pit. I don't have to talk about things that make me uncomfortable when I'm down there. I don't have to deal with the emotions and the shame and the guilt and the anger and the sorrow that eat me up every day. I don't have to deal with all that when I'm in there. When I come up out of that, I'm going to have to deal with those things. I'm going to have to walk in that truth of who, of the decisions I made, of the things I've done, of things that are haunting me. When I can't do that. Can I tell you a story today? Can I tell you a story of a, a young girl who grew up in church, whose parents are pastors, right? Like she's a pastor's kid. She grew up, did anybody here remember Sunday night church? Y'all got Sunday night, anybody got Sunday night church in their roots? Like Sunday night, yes, in the back, hallelujah. We, y'all, we, somebody gets slain in the spirit on Sunday night. I mean, it was like, are these dead people? No, they're just in the spirit, hallelujah. And, um, this young girl, man, she had it all. She had loving parents. She knew, you know, about the Lord. She experienced the Lord. She uh, affectionately teases that she had a drug problem growing up because every time the church doors were open, she was drug through them. It was a lot. <laughs> it was, we were just at church all the time. And uh, this young girl who is me, had this moment at 17. You know, in high school, obviously, I had it all together. And so uh, I remember going to my parents and be like, listen, um, this whole, like, you have to serve God every day, oh, that, it's just really, it's eating up a lot of my time. I can't really prioritize that right now. So I'm just I'm just going to move that to the back burner because, like, I believe in God. I believe in him. Like, he, he, I believe he's there. But the daily relationship, like, I cannot commit to that. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, Can, if your kid comes to you and says that, like, if any one of my three boys come to me, I'm like, sit your tail down. Get some five-fold ministry up in here. What is wrong with you? Right? Like, what in the world? And I got to see a, a parent and, and pastor's heart work in that moment because they were so gracious and compassionate. And they were like, Wendy, we cannot call you into ministry. We cannot call you into a relationship with the Lord. Honey, that is something you have to choose on your own. That is something that you have to invest in. You can't get in on our relationship and get in on what we've done and on our good merits and our, you know, 25 years of church ministry. No, you have to make that choice. Now understand, we will be praying for you and you know the power of prayer and you've seen it firsthand what it can do. So watch out, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't ever stop praying for your kids. Don't ever stop praying for your kids. J.G. Stipe has a quote. He says, faith is like a toothbrush. Everyone should have one and use it regularly, but you should not try to use someone else's. Right? And that's what faith is like. It's exactly what they said to me. It's like, when? You got to find it for you, for who you are. I did not take heed to those words. I was like, eh, whatever. Okay. Remember, 17? <laughs> My low point was 19 years old, sitting alone, broken into a million pieces college, Christian college, dorm room, bathroom floor, holding a positive pregnancy test in my hand, completely unwilling to take on the responsibility, unmarried. I don't know how it works in Maryland, but in Virginia, you don't get pregnant from eating too much Mexican food. You read between the lines there? Mm-hmm. So there are some things in Wendy's life that is not lining up with the word of God. Not a lot of righteous and holy living happening. I knew the choice. I knew who to call. I knew where to go. But I couldn't get past the thoughts of what would they think? 
What would they do? How would they treat my family? How could I ever show my face again? How was I supposed to take a nine-month walk of shame in front of a church family? How was I supposed to do that? How was I ever supposed to survive that? And I let those lies speak louder than the truth of what I knew that God wanted me to choose life. And I just couldn't wrap my head around that. And a local women's health clinic told me that I had choices. And that it would be a quick and easy solution to this problem that I had. You don't forget moments like that. A moment where you, you take a pill that causes you to have a miscarriage at five and a half weeks pregnant. And that solution is what launches you into a self-imposed prison of guilt, anger, shame, depression, and sorrow for 15 years. For 15 years, I felt unworthy. For 15 years, I couldn't see past this choice, this solution, this quick and easy thing that was supposed to take all of it away. It's what launched me into this world of despair. I remember in my early 20s, I was teasing with them in the first service. I was like, I'm pretty sure there's still like tear and snot stains at the altar where I rededicated my life to the Lord. Like there was so much happening in those moments. And in my early 20s, I was like, okay, Lord, I want to do this daily thing. Like, I want to serve you. I want to follow you, whatever it is to make, like, this ugh go away. I can't do it anymore. And I knew he had forgiven me. Like, I'd asked for forgiveness, but, like, there was still just something that was holding me back. It was just really easy to hide in that pit. It was really easy not to let anybody in that close. It was just really easy just to be like, mm, I'm just... I do remember the, one of the, the first verses that I memorized coming up out of all of that and rededicating my life to the Lord was Psalms 23, 6. Are you guys familiar? That only goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord for as long as I live. <laughs> Amen? And I knew that, like, he wanted to restore me. He wanted to redeem me. But I didn't feel worthy. I, just, I didn't feel like it was something that I deserved. I felt like I was supposed to live in the pit. I felt like that was like, no, like you, I should never be able to feel joy again after what I did. I should never be able to feel peace again after what I did. I should never be able to walk in truth and forgiveness after what I had done. But I want to tell you today that whatever your struggle is, whatever you've walked through, whatever that habit is, whatever that addiction is, whatever that attitude is, the Lord says, I am with you, mighty warrior. And he says, you don't have to live in the pit anymore. You don't have to be afraid anymore. He said, I am with you. I am with you. And I want to encourage you today that he's holding out his hand. I want to know if you'll take it. I want to know if you'll take it. About two years ago, I met Jack and Sheila Harper. I went through the Save One Bible study, and I graduated from that program. And um, <laughs> I walk in the truth and the freedom of God's forgiveness and grace. And I am set free in the name of Jesus today. <laughs> Amen. There is an anointing in this room today. I'm telling you guys, don't miss this. Did you hear me? I, I had asked for forgiveness and lived in the pit anyways. It wasn't until I saw the loving and gracious and kind Savior that willed me out of that pit. And let me tell you something. We're walking along some side of some pits, and we see our friends, and we see our family, and we see our neighbors, and we see our coworkers, and we see our enemies, and we're walking by the pit. Do me a favor, stop and reach out your hand. <laughs> Pull them up out of there. Say, come on, I got you, mighty warrior. We got an enemy to fight. You can't hide anymore. We need you. You can't live in that pit anymore because we need you. 
We have to be the truth tellers on this issue. We got people sitting in our pews who are dealing with abortion who don't feel like they can come up to this altar because they're so full of shame and guilt and they're worried about what you're going to think. Put that wall down. Raise them up out of that pit. Wrap your arms around them. Bring them to this altar and help them find Jesus. My God is love. And love translates and transcends anything else that we could give, right? Like there's nothing that's too big for him. In Romans 12 too, it says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will know to learn God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Amen? So good. But we need your help. Our silence is saying more than what our words are. We are the truth tellers on what God's love, God's grace, and forgiveness can really look like. I have a challenge for you. I want you, next time you see a young woman who is pregnant, I want you to go up to her and I want you to say, thank you for choosing life. Then I want you to wrap your arm around her and I want you to pray with her and I want you to let Jesus do the work of of figuring out how she got to that place. That's none of your business. And God will handle her and God will get right with her and God will get right with that family. But not unless you don't put your arm around and say, come to church with me. Let me show you how to find that. Yeah? Are you with me? Just a different perspective. Just a different way. I think it'll reach further and longer than we ever anticipated, and this is why. I read in Judges 8, 28. This is amazing. I love these like full circle moments. Have y'all read? I mean, this book is amazing. You should read it. It is so good. It's so good. Even though, oh, look, I just showed you a story from the Old Testament. That's fun, okay? Like, seriously, don't start in numbers, though. Like, that's horrible. Don't do that. Don't do it. Or Leviticus. Oh, Lord. Blah. Okay, like, if you need help on where to start, Ask me, I will help you because this, oh, so amazing. Judges 8, 28, okay? What happens is Gideon trusts the Lord, right? He's like, okay, like, I was a farmer, now I'm a warrior. Okay, here we go. And God, you know, they have the whole, like, are you sure, God? Yes, are you sure, God? Yes, are you sure, God? Yes. And then God takes his army and brings it down to an army, okay? All of these things happen. Gideon wins. He's like victorious over this huge army with a very small amount of people. And it's incredible, right? It's it's amazing. Midian and all the ites are gone. Hallelujah. They defeat the they defeat the enemy. Whoop, whoop. Right? This is so cool. So Midian, Judges 8, 28. So Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and they were no longer a threat. Hallelujah. The land was peaceful. 40 years during the days of Gideon. I I don't do a lot of math on the weekends, but I'm going to tell you right now, for seven years of oppression, my God restored and redeemed and gave six times the amount of peace, almost six times the amount of peace. Are you seeing that? I mean, because, you know, I serve a big God who doesn't work in one, two, three. He works in exponential numbers. And he says, let me tell you something. I will restore him, I will redeem, and I will give you back every moment that the enemy thought he had on you. And I was in a prison for 15 years, but let me tell you something. I'm going to be walking in 90 years of peace, and I'm going to take it to my grave. Hallelujah. Because I stand on the truth of the word of God. And I'm only 36 years old, so I know that 90 years from now, when I'm in my grave, my kid's going to be walking in peace. My grandbaby's going to be walking in peace. My great-grandbaby's going to be walking in peace because I said, I'm going to rise up today. I'm going to take the hand of the Lord. I'm not going to let the enemy defeat me any longer. I'm making a choice. I'm taking a stand. We're not going to stay in the pit. You ain't going to find no rowdy rolls and no pits around here. We're standing up for truth. We're standing up for justice. We're standing up for righteousness. And all my days, with the rest of my time here on earth, you will hear me proclaiming that message of truth. 
The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Mighty, mighty warrior. What are you hiding from? Close your eyes for a second. In your mind, what do you see? Do you see walls all around you? You're not letting anybody in. There's no room for anybody else in there. You got too much shame and too much guilt rubbing up against you. The depression and the fear and the anxiety rule too much, press too hard, throw you down too deep. What do you see? Do you see just an average person who's working so hard, trying so hard, pouring their, their life into everything, and at the last minute, it's just taken away? It just feels like the enemy comes in at every moment and steals everything we've tried to ever do. Would you cry out to the Lord today because his hand is right there? And he said, I am with you. I am with you, mighty warrior. You may not see yourself as a warrior today, but I'm telling you, that is your assignment. That is your role. That is who you are called to be. You need to rise up and walk out of that pit in truth and discovery today and find out who this Savior is that wants to call you a mighty warrior. A mighty warrior. Father God, I pray over each and every person in this place today. Lord, I ask that you would bring awareness and truth into these moments. Father God, Lord, we feel your spirit. We know you are working. And in these final moments of this service today, Lord, would we just take time to, to reflect and understand, God, where are we? What are we doing? What has happened? We don't have to live in this way anymore. God, I heard her say that, but I'm not quite sure. I heard her say it would be hard, but, but it sounds like there's some other people that might be willing to take my hand. There might be some other people that are willing to come alongside of me. Today, I challenge you, don't live in the pit anymore. Rise up. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. All right, if I could have the prayer team come on up here. Church, we have two different two different people in this type of room off of that message. We have people that are still in the pit, or we have somebody that is called to, to reach a hand down to those who are in the pit. So in the next couple minutes, Pastor Mike's going to sing a song, and I want you to either, you can stand, you can sit, you can come to the altar, you can come up and pray with somebody. I want you to think, I want you to pray and ask God, where are you? Are you in the pit? Are you filled with shame and regret and you need a loving Savior? Or maybe you just need someone to reach, reach down to you. Or are you in a place right now where you're outside of the pit and there's people all around you that are in pits and they need a, they need a hand? You know it would be really awesome to see this church start to see a lot of broken people come in here with people that are sold out for Christ that this room would be pe people that are sold out for Christ that go out into the world and reach a hand to those who are broken. Don't you, don't you want to be that? Because I know that's what I want. I want to start to see broken people coming here and encountering Jesus Christ. So for the next couple minutes, think about it. Where are you? Where are you at? Are you in the pit? Or are you in a place where you can start reaching down to people and bringing them to come and experience a loving Savior? Think about that. God of all the universe, powerful. Victorious, there is none, no one like you. All the earth is at your feet. 
feet for you alone are mighty king there is none no one like you Lord you're holy there's no other name so worthy of all of my praise I give to you my life take all of me I rejoice in you, my Lord. I find my strength in all you are. For there is none, no one like you. Lord, you're holy. There's no other name so I give to you my life, take all of me. Lord, you're holy, now there's no other name so worthy. Of all of my praise, I give to you my life. Take all of me. Cause my God, you reign over me. This heart proclaims your majesty. For you alone are King of kings. My love, my life. All that I need is my God, you reign over me. This heart proclaims your majesty for you alone. Our King of kings, my love, my life, all that I need. stand with me this morning we're going to keep an atmosphere of prayer in this room so if if you're here and you're you need more time to pray please feel free to continue to pray in here we want to keep an atmosphere of prayer but on your way out i just want to let you know we have ushers at the door they're going to be collecting money 100 percent for missions uh, it'll go to missionaries like wendy um, so if you feel led, please do that. And then also, if you want to talk to Wendy, she has a booth outside in the lobby. Please go talk to her. She has some of the stuff her organization uses and all that kind of stuff. You can talk to her about what God is doing in their ministry. But I'm going to pray, and then you're dismissed. But let's please keep this room an atmosphere of prayer. 
Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you that your spirit is just moving. And you are moving in the lives of your people, Lord God. But God, right now, I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here that feels like they're in a pit, Lord God, that they would they would seek help. They would seek help from a loving Savior. God, that people would notice that they're in a pit and that us as believers would come alongside them. That we'd pray with them. That we'd lead them to a Savior that is so merciful and so gracious. And Father, if there are people in this room and maybe they have had an encounter with Jesus and they are outside of the pit, God, would you embolden them to go out into the community to reach out to those who are broken, that those who are lost. And Father, that we would see broken and lost people come to meet you in this place. Father, we thank you and we praise you. In your name we pray.